Hi everyone, it's Rachel back with the Shades of Orange. Today I'm here to do more stabby reviews. I'm talking about horror, including a lot of 2022 releases as well as some thriller books. Yes, I found another page turner that I would recommend. And I also wanna talk about some true crime, including one involving a Canadian case that either is cracking open the hugest conspiracy in the state of the Mounties and the RCMP, or possibly the author might have been wearing a tinfoil hat while writing his book. I will discuss and let you decide for yourself. All that being said, let's get started. First off, let's talk about They Drowned Our Daughters by Katrina Monroe. This is a book that I received for review from the publisher. And this story follows a young woman who is leaving or separating from their spouse. And so they are moving home to live with their mother for a while. And you find out that they have a difficult relationship with their mother. Their mother is suffering from, I believe, Alzheimer's, so they're starting to lose their memory. The place that they are living has a long history. It's possibly this haunted island and so there's the question of is there more going on or is the mother simply losing her mind this is a book that has a lot of elements that I really do like so I like a difficult daughter mother relationship within a story I like some of the themes that it plays upon the actual myths around the island or the cape were just very intriguing to me and so I really did like that element to the story that history but I will say that my biggest complaint for this book is just one of simply personal taste this book is very slow burning, it's more gothic fiction, and I just did not completely love the story, but I do recognize that it was well written, it had good prose, and so I do think that other people will enjoy this book more depending on their preference for what type of horror they really like. The characters in the story were very unlikable, and I do think to a degree they're meant to be, because again, especially the mother character is meant to be annoying or frustrating because you get to see the story from her daughter's perspective, and so she has to be written that way, but at the same time, I also found her to be frustrating and I didn't really love either the daughter or the mother and it just again kind of grated on me so I do think it was intentional but it just did not help to enhance the story so keep all those elements in mind and decide for yourself again I could see other people loving this one I liked it but just again not personally to my taste Next, we have Burn Down, Rise Up by Vincent Toronto. This is a young adult 2022 horror release that caught my attention. This book is set in the Bronx where we follow a group of young people. This is an own voices story. The characters and the author themselves are black and so you really get to have a fresh perspective. And within the Bronx, you find out that young people are going missing. And of course, there's a question of what is going on. Is there a serial killer? Are they possibly just running away? Or is there something else? This is a book that caught my attention because because it was compared or blurbed to be similar to Stranger Things, which always catches my attention no matter how many times they do that in the marketing. But I'm actually happy to report that I did see some similarities. The setup to the book, again, with missing people and the way it was done, I definitely saw it being similar to that, but not a straight copycat, which I actually appreciated. Again, I think with the Bronx setting, it gave the book kind of more of an urban feel than kind of that sleepy small town that's, you know, typically very white. And so I did like how it leaned into those elements and leans into those tropes but also took a different direction. I thought it was pretty fresh and fun and you know me I can be really critical of young adult horror but this one I didn't mind. I didn't think that there was too much romance in it. I thought the characters weren't that annoying or anything like that so I do think it has some all ages appeal. If you're interested in this one and open to young adult I actually think this is one of the better ones I've read in quite a while. Next up, we have A Fine Dark Line by Joel Lansdell. And this is a coming of age horror book that I read uh, because I've been trying to pick up more coming of age stories over the summer months in order to do a follow-up recommendations video like the first one I did. And essentially we follow a young boy who is in a town where something happens and he goes about trying to investigate and gets involved with some other characters and they try to puzzle things out. So it's very much like a classic coming of age story. And I really like the beginning because it is so nostalgic for a time period and you just really get to be in the character's shoes. However, this young boy is so innocent at the beginning of the story that it did start to grate on me. He just was innocent to such a degree that I had myself rolling my eyes and going, oh, come on, everyone knows about this. And so I did struggle a little bit because yes, it's supposed to be about that break of innocence, but he was so innocent at the beginning. And in my opinion, he kind of still stayed a bit young and naive. And I wanted 
decided that incense just ripped away from him. And again, I think that's more my preference when it comes to coming of age stories that I do like the ones where someone is just devastated and their childhood is broken. That wasn't the case here. And I just found this book to be a little bit lacking or again, not to my taste. So I didn't love it. I know that Joe Lansdale is a really popular author. So if you do have other recommendations for other books that I should try by him, I'd love to know with a comment down below. Next, we have The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by Stieg Larsson, and I think everyone knows this one. Don't worry, it's actually a reread for me, so yes, I have read this years ago, but it was back when my channel was a baby. I think I had 100 subscribers, so if anyone actually remembers me reviewing this the first time, I'd love to hear a comment down below, but I assume that no one was watching me at that time. Anyway, I think you know the basic setup. It's a mystery thriller novel that follows a journalist who is hired to investigate this cold case of this young girl who went missing years ago and is presumed to be dead and it also gets tied in with another investigator, Elizabeth, who gets pulled in and works with them to try to puzzle it all out. This book is one that I want to revisit because it is so beloved. Again, I assume all of you have heard of this book and probably have read it, but of course I'll still keep the spoiler free. But basically this is a book that I want to revisit because I looked at it on Goodreads and I only gave it three stars. And I really wanted to know if my opinion had changed. What I remember is that this book was pushed into my hand by a friend who said this book is so buzzy you gotta check it out it was when I was first getting back into reading and I remember the first hundred pages was such a pain to get through I really struggled with the book and while I liked elements later on I gave the book only three stars because it was so hard to get into and if that friend had been pushing me to say have you finished the book have you read it yet I honestly would have just DNF'd it but I did push through and I did like the book but I want to revisit it now because as I mentioned my tastes have changed drastically I think I read that book oh probably honestly 10 years ago now so it was about time to look and see if I had different thoughts on it long story short I really enjoyed it so much more the second time around I will stand by the fact that I don't think it's the strongest beginning there's a lot of parts of the stories that involve the journalist his past and just the scandal and the law and his like court trial and all of that and the way it's done I found very dry and you just don't really know why you're supposed to care about it Elizabeth Salander however is an amazing character her parts are so brutal, huge content warnings for sexual assault and violence towards women within this book. But oh my goodness, some of the most memorable scenes that yes, I did remember the first time around and now they are just burned into my brain. So if you can handle really dark stories, I do think this is one of the best. And the mystery itself was really good. I love a cold case and this one was nice because it was done on like an island setting where it was closed off. And so you know that there was only a limited number of suspects, which I really like. And we as a reader, are trying to piece things together, go through the clues and all of that. I do think that in terms of characters, the journalist Bloomquist is just okay and Elizabeth definitely steals the show. But yeah, I love it so much. Finally, I did get a chance to go and watch the Daniel Craig movie because I love Daniel Craig and that was really enjoyable too. But yeah, tough to watch those violent scenes. There's some really dark messed up parts in this book and of course in the movie. So if you for some reason have not read this book, highly recommend it. I definitely had to increase my reading to a good solid four stars and I would absolutely recommend it to anyone who shares my taste in dark and disturbing books. Then we have A Kiss Before Dying by Ira Levin and this is a bit of a mystery thriller book that follows a man who decides to murder his pregnant girlfriend and his only concern is how he's going to get away with it because if you know statistically, men will more likely go after their spouse when they are pregnant. So when a pregnant woman dies, the police are naturally going to go after their partner first. And so he's really worried about getting away with this. So I thought the premise of this book was absolutely amazing because you get the story told from this despicable man's perspective and it's all about him trying to get away with it. And of course, as the story goes on, people start to notice that there's very suspicious clues. Her death is framed to be a suicide, but doesn't look quite right. And so slowly things start to unravel. It's a book where I liked the setup and premise a little bit more than the execution, which I found before a few times with Ira Levin, but definitely he's an author that I love to watch because of course he's more classic. His books have been written years ago, but I do find that he kind of plays with some dark themes that I really like. And again, I am a sucker for any kind of story told from the villain's perspective. So definitely a cool one to check out and one I feel like is pretty underhyped, at least, you know, modern booktube today. 
Now switching over to true crime, I want to talk about 22 Murders by Paul Pelagio, and this is a book that centered around a horrific massacre that happened in Eastern Canada, specifically in Nova Scotia, during the height of the pandemic. And a lot of people aren't actually aware of the events. Essentially, there was a gunman who went around and killed, obviously given the title, 22 people over the course of a night and into the following morning. And this book is a response to that, basically an investigation of the case and a criticism of of the RCMP or Mounties reaction to this crime. Now, I do think that some of the criticisms within this book are valid because you find out that when this was all happening, the RCMP used Twitter in order to alert the public, which maybe doesn't sound bad to someone perhaps in the States, but here in Canada, we have provincial systems where the police can send out a message that will go to everyone's cell phone regardless of which provider they're on and will give them an immediate emergency alert saying, stay inside, this is happening happening and I've received those as well within my province. Thankfully they've always been false alarms, things like that, but it's a very good system to use and they didn't use it. However, from my perspective, I did kind of feel that it was more a mistake or a failure of the Mounties to be properly prepared for such a incident to occur because there is a, not that much mass violence that happens here compared to in the States. So I would question whether or not they were fully prepared for something like this to happen and just didn't follow the correct protocols. But the author really goes goes a step further and he suggests that this whole thing was a big cover-up, that they are hiding something, that there's more going on, that there is so much that is happening and they were trying to apprehend this guy without the public finding out. And yeah, if you believe it all, it's a really intense, crazy story that really just rips apart our entire police operations. And maybe there is truth to that. Obviously, I do not know. I'm not behind those closed doors. But as the story went on, I started to wonder again if the author was perhaps wearing a tinfoil hat and I am just a huge skeptic so to be fair you have to keep that in mind but I really felt like the author just went too far with some of his ideas and things that he was suggesting. So for instance, this is gonna fall off my head. For instance, to give you an example, within the narrative, he mentions the fact that the 911 calls were not publicly released. However, within the book itself, he also acknowledges that it is against our privacy regulations in Canada to release them. Apparently in the States, you just have them as public um, property. But in here in Canada, that's actually something that you just don't release to the public. So he's criticizing them for hiding these tapes, but then it's also acknowledged that if they were to release those tapes, they would be breaching our own privacy regulations of our government. So I kind of feel like the author was just overstepping and just, again, like kind of going a little bit too far. And I'm sure that there are places that the response could be better, but I'm skeptical. If you were someone who kind of loves to read a good conspiracy theory, whether or not you believe it or not, you want to read a really interesting tale, this is one to check out, but you need to go into it knowing that it's heavily, heavily biased. This author is a a known critic of the RCMP. He even admits it within the book and you can tell that this book was written with a particular line of reasoning that is written all throughout the book and is meant to lead the reader to a particular conclusion. So if you are interested in the case I would cautiously say to pick it up but I would really encourage you to read this with a critical eye and with a grain of salt and not take the author's messages at face value because yeah it was a really incredible story a little bit bloated a little bit too long but yeah, I'm skeptical of what he was presenting within the book. It was a lot. So yes, maybe I'm a naive Canadian like the author suggests, but honestly, I think that they were doing their best and that just is what it is. And finally, I want to talk about Shadow Man, and this is an account of the beginnings of criminal profiling. So I think most people who are true crime junkies are familiar with the Mindhunter book, which of course was turned into a Netflix series. But before the events of the Mindhunter took place, where there's an actual FBI unit that was set up to focus on criminal profiling, this book accounts the case that led to that being formed, essentially the introduction of criminal profiling practices used to solve a case Within this book, there is a young girl that is stolen away from her campsite. And when the police just draw a blank and they can't figure out who to go to, they do reach out to some people who have experience in criminal profiling and they put together a profile and are able to point to an individual that fits that profile. The police who are actually in charge of the investigation are rather skeptical at first. And they're like, no, no, this guy's good. 
and of course the profilers keep pointing and saying, you gotta go after that guy, you gotta go after that guy. And as you can imagine, the evidence actually starts to back that up, and so it does create some validity. So I really like this book because it kind of bridges the conversation between like, you know, people seeing profilers as like psychics and actually bring it down to the level of, you know, being actual science. For the most part, I enjoyed this one. I do think it had a kind of slower start and a couple sections that weren't as interesting, but overall, I think that if you are someone who reads a lot of true crime that like to be really immersed in the genre, I do feel like this is a missing puzzle piece that you really should check out, again, if you're a big fan of John Douglas and want to know what happened kind of preceding those events. So interesting book there and a case that I had never heard of before. So that is it for this video here. I'd love to hear of the books I talked about, which ones are you planning on checking out for yourself? And as well, I would love to hear your opinions on books that are possibly showing conspiracy theories. Are they worthwhile to read? Are you a big skeptic like myself? Do you think that they're all bogus, but you kind of read them anyway? Love to hear opinions there. Also, let me know about my new stylish hat. Is this a look I should continue in future videos? If you're new to my channel, please consider subscribing. I do read a lot of horror thrillers, science fiction, fantasy, and true crime. If you want to help me out, you can share this video around online, give it a thumbs up, drop a comment. Is there a little emoji for a tinfoil hat? Let's find out. And if you want to hit the little notification bell, you'll never miss a video from me. Thanks so much for watching. I'll talk to you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.